Okay, good morning. It's time to begin our class together. Certainly welcome those who are here in person, and we also welcome those who are tuned in online to our continuing study of the Book of Romans from the Central Church of Christ here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. We're glad you're with us. We have some visitors here with us this morning. We're especially glad for that. Appreciate you. And uh, I would ask you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 10. We're going to begin there in just a moment, Romans chapter 10. Uh, before we begin our study together, Brother Scott Petty will lead us in a word of prayer, please. Scott. You bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together here today and study your word. We're uh, thankful for the, the guests that we have and that uh, the people were able to make it here and, and, and be uh, together in fellowship with one another. We ask that you help open our minds to the lessons to, about to be presented to us and that you help the uh, instructor here, the teacher who's bringing us this lesson, remember what they've studied and that they can... Uh, present it in a manner that's easy for us to absorb and, and apply to our own lives, but uh, we ask that you help us have the courage to take it outside these doors and share it with those that may not be aware of what you're capable of bringing into their lives and that uh, what it is that they're missing in their lives. We ask that you help us continue to grow both physically and spiritually here and that you uh, forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, when you look at the uh, 10th chapter of the book of Romans, you see that it falls in line with the general outline of the book, which we've gone over several times. And it's really part of a three chapter section, which is at the bottom of this chart, the condition of fleshly Israel in their rejection of the gospel. <clears throat> that would be chapters 9, 10, and 11. All of them really center around that theme, and Paul picks up various uh, lines of argument that are very related to that as he goes through this material. We've already studied chapter 9, so let's get into chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. We'll read a few verses here together and then, and then stop and draw some points from this. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my supplication to God is for them that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness to everyone that believeth. All right. We see that Paul is expressing his personal anxiety and concern for his Jewish brethren. That is, his kinsmen according to the flesh. The Israelite people in general, of which Paul was one. I mean, Paul was a Jew. He had been raised in the strict uh, teaching of the Mosaic Law. He sat at the feet of a very prominent Jewish lawyer by the name of Gamaliel. In terms of his education, he was extremely well-versed in the Jewish law. Well, the thing is, Paul points out here that even though they were religious, by and large, the Jewish people had rejected Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They had rejected the gospel of Christ. They had rejected the church of Christ. Although there were exceptions to that, that was the general consensus. When men are religious and when they are zealous, now what does the word zealous mean? He uses it there in the what second verse. He says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. What is zeal? Like a strong desire. Strong desire, yes. A strong desire and motivation. Uh, really motivated. Do you remember how you felt when you first became a Christian? 
when you were first baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, which according to the Bible is when the Lord adds a person to the church. You remember your zeal, your excitement, your enthusiasm. Well, Paul says that's true of them. Occasionally, we will uh, have people knock on our door, religious people, good-hearted people, very zealous. Or we will receive things in the mail or pamphlets that will be left at the house and things from people who are very zealous, very uh, enthusiastic. But Paul says that zeal alone or being zealous in matters of religion is not sufficient. And the Jewish people there, by and large, they were very zealous. Now, when people are religious and when they are zealous and when they are content to have a partial knowledge, now notice this, a partial knowledge of God's will, of God's word, even though a full knowledge is available to them, What's going to happen? Well, invariably, they're going to establish their own religions, their own traditions, their own practices, their own doctrines, and that's exactly what the Jewish people had done. The Pharisees, prominent religious leaders among the Jews, had established basically their own religion. Uh, they were binding things that were not in the old law. They were loosing things that were in the law. So they were basically saying uh, uh, themselves what religion ought to be. And don't we have the same thing today? I mean, look at the divided religious world in which we live. We have people who are very zealous. You've got to hand it to them. They're, sometimes they're more zealous than members of the Lord's church. Okay, And they're religious. They, they continue to practice these things. They're regular in their observance of their traditions, their teachings. But it is based largely upon their uh, books, their creeds, their uh, directions. In fact, some of them will will just as soon give you a copy of their particular creed and as they will give you the Bible. And if you ever have a conversation with some of these people, you'll find that when it comes to a choice between the Bible and what their church teaches, many of them will go along with what their church teaches. Even, even if you show them clearly, hey, look, the Bible says such and such. It can be very frustrating to try to study with some some religious people along that line today because they will choose their church and their church teachings over and above the word of God and that ought not to be that way but that's what was happening here with with regard to the Jews uh, they invariably established their own religion uh, that was wrong in Paul's day it is still wrong today God is very specific as to what he wants and what he expects. And, and when we choose to ignore that and follow our own dictates or whatever they may be, uh, we are disobeying God. It's a situation he, with which when you think about it, you know he cannot be happy. All right. God himself devised the sacred plan for salvation. And that's what Paul has been revealing here and discussing in the whole book of Romans. He's been saying what the gospel is and that it is God's plan for salvation. And God has put forth but one plan. You remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one cometh to the Father but by me. There's one way. One plan for all responsible human beings everywhere. And that is the plan which we are re required to follow. We're amenable to that plan or answerable to it. If you think of the Great Commission there in Mark 16, where Jesus sent forth his apostles, verses 15 and 16, he said, 
Uh, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, not some creed or some other plan, but the gospel, the good news of God, of Jesus Christ. There are countless millions of people today in this country and probably right in your own community, there are many of them, who refuse to obey the gospel of Christ upon the same grounds that these Jews refused to obey it. They're religious, they're zealous, and they're ignorant of God's plan for man's righteousness. And so they become a part of and they hold to a human plan. And they steadfastly refuse to consider the truth of God. All right? So with that, think of those principles as, we, as Paul addresses these people. His heart is heavy. He's concerned. I'm sure that Paul shed many tears over the situation because he saw the, the, the plight that they were in, my heart's desire, and my supplication to God. That means he was praying to God for these people. What was his prayer? That they may be what? Saved. And then he says, I bear them witness. In other words, I'll be the first one to, to, to affirm on their behalf, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. It falls short in that sense. And then he says, for being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, the word ignorant there is not used in a pejorative sense. I mean, uh, he's not insulting them like we might say, oh, you're an ignorant person. How can man attain to or acquire the righteousness of God? That's really what the book is about. And he's saying that's the thing that they are ignorant of. Um, And they're ignorant of God's plan for man's righteousness. So they become a part of holding on to to human plans. Verse 3, for being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their... You see the difference in those two things? Very critical. If you're going to get Romans, you've got to get verse 3 here. By the way, those who get Romans, God gets them. That's been said, we've, t- we've mentioned that before. There's a fundamental principle right here, and here it is again in verse 3. Think about it. Being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. Think of the religious people that you know in your life, your neighbors, co-workers, who are religious. Now, I'm not talking about people who just blatantly deny the very existence of God, and there are those people too, but I'm talking now about religious people. Don't they seek to establish their own righteousness? I mean, don't they want you to know that they are right? Nobody who is religious wants to believe that they are wrong. They, they want to believe that they're right. And they seek to establish their righteousness. They want to show you if, you, if you ever get into a discussion with them, they'll believe me, they, they won't just roll over and say, oh, you're right. They, they'll show you, well, here's why I'm right on this. That's why it's very critical that we develop relationships with people in our lives that appear to be teachable and interested so that we can share with them the gospel of Christ and give them opportunity to examine their own beliefs, their own position, instead of just constantly seeking to establish their own uh, righteousness. And he says, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. You see, there's the result of that attitude. 
If we have the humility of heart that says, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. In other words, God, whatever you say, you just say the word, and I'll do it. I'll believe it. I'll submit. If we have that kind of attitude, then we're subjecting ourselves to the righteousness of God. And we're not being ignorant of his righteousness, seeking to establish our own. Any comments or questions on any of that now? Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law. Before I talk about that, any questions down through verse 3 or comments? All right. And for those visiting, we're broadcasting live. We have people viewing. I don't know how many people are viewing, but it's usually for this class uh, uh, well over 100, maybe 150 people viewing on, or connections online. So if you'd like to make a comment, we'd love to have your comment. We do ask that you speak up and keep it brief, but, uh, and I will, may try to repeat your comment so that everybody hears it uh, for the for purposes of the, our audience online. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now the word end there, I think, does not refer to uh, the cessation of the law but rather to the aim or purpose of the law. The aim or the purpose of the law. We use the word end in English in at least two different ways. There is that way, talking about the stopping or the finishing of something, the end of the story. But the word end can also mean the aim, the desired purpose. For example, we we might say the end justifies the means. Well, there we're using the word end to talk about the result, the the final purpose or what we're trying to get to. Okay, And I think that's the way Paul is using the word here. The end of the law, that is the purpose of the law or the aim of the law. He says is Christ. I mean, the whole point of the law, why it was even given, was to to lead men and women to prepare them for Jesus Christ. Okay? It was like a tutor. What is a tutor? Well, a tutor is someone who teaches and leads us to the truth. And by the way, when Paul talked about the old law being our tutor, I think maybe a, uh, the, the word that's translated tutor there actually in our culture carries kind of the idea of the school bus driver. That is the person who brings us to the place of learning. That's really the idea behind that word that Paul uses. It's translated tutor in some translations. The Old Testament, the old law, is like our school bus driver. It brought people to the Christ, really the, the, the truth, the ultimate truth and source of knowledge. Christ is the end of the law unto righteousness to everyone that believeth. And again, we have to understand the word believeth there is not talking merely about mental agreement, like so many people in the world talk about belief, No, he's talking about obedient belief. Belief and obedience coupled together. Uh, If you you would, look back at Romans chapter 8 for a moment, verses 3 and 4. Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. See, back there Paul had had already made the point that the old law was insufficient because of human rejection, human stubbornness, human rebellion. A refusal to, to follow the law, really. So the law was temporary. It was destined to end, and it did end. 
at the cross of Christ. It was nailed to the cross so that today we're living under the new law, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Christ is the end or the purpose of the law, the aim of the law, to every, unto righteousness to everyone that believeth. Okay, comments or questions there? First four verses. Let's move to verse five. For Moses writeth that the man that doeth the righteousness which is of the law shall live thereby. Now that's uh, chapter 10 and verse five. And Paul is going to uh, begin here a series of Old Testament quotations. If you have a Bible that has footnotes or marginal notes that show where these quotations are from, that may be very helpful in the upcoming verses. But if not, you may want to jot them down. What's he quoting? He says, Moses writeth. And then he quotes, uh, this is verse 5. There's a quotation then from Leviticus, what is it? Chapter 18 and verse 5. Is that the note that you have? All right, Leviticus 18 and verse 5. He's quoting there. Why does he say Moses writeth? And then quote from Leviticus. What does that tell us? They certainly would have been familiar with it, yes. What else does that tell us? Moses writeth, and then he quotes from Leviticus. This is not a trick question. Yeah, it tells us that Moses wrote Leviticus. The reason I emphasize that, you know, there are those today who claim that Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible like we've always taught and understood. In fact, that's, that claim has been going on for 100 years or more. There were those back in J.W. McGarvey's day who taught that because if they can destroy the mosaic authorship of the first five books, they can call into question the entire Bible. In fact, Brother McGarvey wrote a book, a whole book called The Authorship of Deuteronomy. And he presented some brilliant arguments there about who actually wrote these books, these first five books of the law. You say, well, wait a minute. Some of the things that happened in there happened after Moses died. Yes. And some of them happened before he was born, too, didn't they? I mean, look at Genesis, where Moses writes about the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven. Well, how did he know these things? Because he was inspired by God. God inspired or directed the writing of those Bible books. Okay? And so the book teaches over and over. It affirms that concept many, many times. So when, when Paul says that Moses writeth, and then quotes from Leviticus, you can be sure that Moses was the writer, the penman of these passages, that passage there, for example, from Leviticus. And what did he write? That the man that doeth the righteousness which is of the law shall live thereby. The righteous shall live by the law, by the words of the works and the commandments of the law. Verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith saith thus, say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who shall descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now again, verses six and seven appear to be some quotations where he says, say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven, quoting there from Deuteronomy 30, beginning at verse 12. It's as if Paul is meeting some objections here that he knew, he knew just a sure shooting that they were going to say. The Jews were going to say, well, if, if, uh, if, Christ, if Christ is the Son of God, as you claim, and uh, you say he's in heaven, uh, then we ought to be shown heaven. We ought to be able to be there with Christ in heaven to know that. Or bring Christ down to us. Or if he's in that Hadean realm what Paul calls here uh, the abyss, then bring him up from there. Let's, let's, let's see it from him in person. Well, what's the problem with that thinking? <laughs> two, two problems, really. What is the problem with saying, we'll believe if you bring Christ here in person? 
I mean, they had already done that, hadn't they? I mean, Christ had already been there in person. Did they believe him? No, they rejected him. They nailed him to a cross. All right. And the other problem is this. You don't have to have Christ personally present in order to believe on him. Now, I, I understand Christ is with us in spirit. He's here today, right now. But you don't have to have Christ sitting beside you in person, physically present, in order to believe on him. That's what Paul is saying. He is meeting an objection here that some of these Jews probably would have made to his teaching. Verse 8, but what saith it? Okay, that is, what, what saith the scripture? What saith the old law? Paul often introduces a quotation by that question. What does it say? What does the Bible say, in other words? It says, the word is nigh thee. The word nigh means what? Near. Near. And I would suggest to you that here, by, by nigh, he's basically saying easy. Easily accessible. Did you ever sit down in a reclining chair and you didn't have your glasses on and you went to read something and you started fumbling around, where are my glasses, where are my glasses? Am I the only one that ever, that ever happened to? Or maybe in, in, in bed, you, you, you get in bed and you want to read something, oh, where's my glasses? And you're fumbling around. <clears throat> and here they were right there near you all along. They were nigh. The word means easily reached or accessible. What Paul is saying by quoting this Old Testament passage is that the gospel, the word of God is not hard to find. It's, it's right there. They, these Jews had no excuse. They couldn't say, oh, it, it's some distant learning that we don't have. No, God has made it available. Even today, isn't the Bible, the word of God, readily accessible if a person really wants to find it, to, to, to know it. Now, if a person doesn't want to know it, that's a different situation. But if you're interested in what God says on the matter, you can find out. You can know. It is nigh thee. It's near. Um, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Right. And neither will they listen to somebody from. Right. Ginger makes the point that there in Luke 16 with the case of the rich man and Lazarus. The request was, well, just send Lazarus and, and then we'll believe. No, they have Moses and the prophets, which is a way of saying they have the Old Testament. So, yeah, it's there. It is available. We, we don't have an excuse. The Jews had no excuse. Specifically what he's talking about here is the Jews. But the same is true for us. We have no excuse in saying, you know, I, I, I can't understand the Bible. I, I, can't, I don't have a copy of the Bible around or I can't find what God's word is. No. The word is near if you want it. That's what Paul is saying. Another comment? Question? Uh, Chris? I'm actually going to bring up very much the same thing um, where he said uh, they, they won't believe even if one were to be raised from the dead. He was predicting what was about to happen. Jesus was telling this account to say, you've got Moses and the prophets, even if one were to rise from the dead, like I'm going to do, they're not going to believe. Okay. And John in his gospel specifically said, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you may have life through his name. Yes. And so John is saying, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And these words are written that you can believe and know that. Right. And Jesus coupled that with what Jesus said, that even with Moses and the prophets and this evidence, there will still be those who will not believe. Yes. 
even with the raising of Jesus from the dead, Chris points out, there would still be those who would not believe. Just like the rich man and Lazarus, even though one were raised from the dead. Uh, if we don't accept the Bible, we would not be convinced by amazing miracles, hordes of people doing something or moving in a certain direction. We, we, that just, it wouldn't mean anything to us really persuasively if we would not be convinced by the word of God himself. Yeah, I think that's right. So the word of God is near you. It's easily obtained. Uh, incidentally, uh, I think their objection is basically, they're saying we cannot believe without the personal presence of Christ. And Paul is saying, well, number one, you had that and you rejected him. And number two, it wouldn't matter anyway. Because if thou, verse 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Jesus is Lord, as Lord. <clears throat> Notice the word as there is in italics. What's that tell you? It's not in the original text. So take that as a clue from your translators. They're, they're just telling you, hey, we didn't have this word, but we're giving it to you because we think this is the meaning here. <clears throat> because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord and shalt believe in thy heart, And it is often quoted in isolation, that is, out of context, as the whole story, without stopping to understand the meaning of those phrases as Paul gives them here. It's like drawing out a, a, you know, one particular section of the law and saying, here's, here's the whole law. Now, you, you've got to look at the whole context. What's he saying? It start verse laws. That should give us a clue. Because if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, what is it that we are confessing right before we are baptized into Christ and continue to confess after we're baptized? What is that? What are we saying? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is Lord of this universe and of my life. Okay? <clears throat> and why is it important to confess that with the mouth? He, I mean, he makes that pretty clear. It's not just a mental confession. Confess with the mouth. By the way, when you pray, do you ever pray silently? Sure you do. You pray with your eyes closed and your head bowed, and nobody can hear you. Sometimes, probably you do that. But notice, this confession here is not a silent confession. He says, Whoso, who, whoso if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. This is a verbal, oral confession. And it's very specific. Confessing that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus, confess Jesus as Lord. Okay, so confession is clearly a requirement for salvation. I don't see how anybody could, in light of verse 9 there and verse 10 coming, could, could miss that. Any questions on that? I know some of our friends, our religious friends, don't teach that. Remember in Jesus' day, too, there were those... John chapter 6, John chapter 12. There, there were those who believed in Jesus Christ, but they wouldn't confess it. Why not? They were afraid. they were afraid of being cast out of the synagogue. These are religious leaders who were at home in the synagogue. That's where their authority was, their prominence and prestige. They didn't want to lose that. So they wouldn't confess it with their mouth. They believed it in their heart, but they wouldn't say that they believed it. And uh, John goes on to explain it's because they love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. The praise of men over the praise of God. And that's really our problem when we 
are shy about confessing Christ. We're thinking more about men, pleasing men, than we are about pleasing God. Okay? So he says, you've got to confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. And notice this, the other half there, and thou shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. What is it about Christ that we must believe? Must we believe that he was a man, that he existed, historical figure? Well, that's part of it, but that's not really the whole story, is it? I mean, many non-Christian people will admit that Jesus Christ lived. They believe in Jesus Christ in that sense, just like you might believe in George Washington, that he was an actual historical figure. But there's more to it, isn't there? He says, believe in thy heart, which suggests deep conviction in, in thy heart. You ever talk about your heart of hearts? This is where you really have your core opinions and beliefs and convictions. Believe in your heart. What? That God raised him from the dead. Now, Lord willing, tonight we get into Romans or 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There is the great resurrection chapter. And the first part of that chapter, he's going to show the fact that Jesus Christ was raised. That's a historical fact from the dead. Well, Christians must believe that. Okay? So when we say to someone who comes down the aisle, and they say, I want to be baptized, or maybe they'll contact us by email or text or something and say, you know, I want to be baptized. Okay, we make arrangements. But before we baptize them, we want to be assured that they believe that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. Son of God. Okay. Questions or comments? So if you're looking for a plan of salvation right here, Paul has already given two key components to that, hasn't he? Belief in Christ as, the, as Lord, as the Son of God, that, he, that God raised him from the dead, and confession of that belief that he's Lord. All right. Look at verse 10 now. For... And here the word for is obviously explaining what he's just said. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now stop for a minute. That phrase unto righteousness, doesn't that sound familiar in our study of the book of Romans? The whole book has been about how do I get to righteousness? God's plan for man's righteousness. The word unto is an old word in English, and it means advancing to that point. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. That's how you get to righteousness. That's what Paul is saying. And with the mouth, confession is made, watch it, unto salvation. Do you see that the phrase unto righteousness is put alongside of the phrase unto salvation? And they essentially mean the same thing. Belief unto righteousness, <coughs> excuse me, confession unto salvation. Belief is important and required, but confession is also important and required. Both of them are steps, if you will, getting us, advancing us into this righteousness that comes from God himself. All right. Any question now down through verse 10 or comment or thing, anything you wanted to add on, on that? Any questions from our online audience? I don't, I don't hear any. All right, then we'll go forward. Verse 11, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be put to shame. 
All right, now here again, Paul continues this series of Old Testament quotes. Where is he quoting from this time? Which prophet? Do you have it? Uh, not yet. That's coming. Look at verse 11. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be put to shame. Well, maybe Joel said something like that. I have a, I have a note that this is from Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah. It really perhaps doesn't matter, I guess, which Old Testament prophet he's quoting from, but the point is he's building an argument that they would respect as Jewish uh, Christians familiar with that old law and the prophets. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be put to shame or be uh, in an embarrassing position before God. Nobody wants to be uh, embarrassed before God on the day of judgment. Remember the parable that Jesus told about the wedding feast and the man who was found there among the guests not having a, not wearing a, a wedding garment. How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was what? Speechless. Yes, speechless. That's the idea here put to shame or embarrassed or speechless. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all and is rich unto all that call upon him. Now here Paul introduces another phrase that we need to understand. All that call upon him. Well, what does it mean to call upon him? Does it mean to simply say, Lord, Lord. Is that what it means to call upon him? No. How do you know that? Matthew. What did Matthew say? Well, Jesus actually said it, but you know, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. Yes. Yeah, good verse. Good verse to keep in mind here. Chris mentioned Matthew said what, seven twenty one, where uh, Matthew records Jesus saying, Not everyone who saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. We know, therefore, that calling on the name of the Lord is more than just saying, Lord, Lord. I think we could establish that in a number of other ways as well, including the context right here. He has already mentioned several concrete things that a person must do in order to get into this righteousness of God. He must confess with his mouth. He must believe with his heart. Now he's saying we must call upon him. We must call on the name of the Lord. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all and is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, now here's another quote, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, where's this one from? Which prophet? Joel. There's your, your quote from Joel, right? Joel 2 and verse 32. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, I'm wondering, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? If it doesn't just mean to say, Lord, Lord, well, what does it mean? Well, verse 14, he commences to lay it out and explain that. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? All right. So whatever it means to call upon the name of the Lord, it, include, it obviously includes belief. It, or it builds upon belief because he says you can't call upon the name of the Lord if you haven't believed. That's verse 14. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? All right, now here's another element. Belief is important, but there's something before belief. What's that? To hear. To hear, to hear yes. How can you believe on him in whom you've not heard? How can you believe in Jesus Christ if you've never heard of Jesus Christ? That's what he's saying. 
All right. So you see how he's bu bu building a train here of thought, laying out God's plan of salvation. And he takes us even a step further back here to hearing the gospel, hearing of Jesus Christ. This also is part of calling on the name of the Lord. I want to thank you for listening carefully and patiently this morning. We're going to conclude there. We'll stop there, verse 14, 15, uh, and plan to resume in our next study there. Uh, please join us in about 15 minutes for our worship service together. Come back to us at that time. We look forward to, to worshiping God with you at that, at that time.